Yes, I'm going to be talking about, in a very short period of time, both the journey that this sensor has taken, which has started a long way away, is going to be going to Mars very shortly, and ending up with something which is quite prosaic, which is looking for pipes underground. So where we've started is, um, in fact, what's burnt out just about the last six years of my life, is the delivery of a set of sensors to measure Mars quakes. Um, these are micro-machine silicon sensors. I will pass around a one I pulled off the line. Please be careful. There's a reason why this off the line. It is uh, not absolutely perfect, but you can get the idea of how this operates. So please have a look and pass it on. Um, but if you're delivering any hardware for space, you generally want it to be low mass, low power, and robust. Work over large temperature ranges, and also we need it to be very sensitive. In fact, we don't know how sensitive because nobody's measured a Mars quake before. But it'll be our first way of looking inside another planet. Um, so all of our sensors, our electronics, is coming in at around 600 grams. Um, the power, supply, the power drawer is 300 milliwatts, and this is fully qualified for flight. Um, so I'm going to be looking at how this sensor um, back on Earth is going to, uh, uh, where it might be applied, how it can operate. But at the moment, these are sitting actually underneath this orange thermal shield as part of a larger system. This is in Lockheed Martin in Denver, and... Uh, this spacecraft is going to be flown out to California conventionally on a plane, put on a rocket, and in May next year, the InSight mission will be going up from Vandenberg Air Force Base, the first planetary mission actually from the West Coast. Normally, Florida is our starting point. Now, the sensor itself is about as conventional <laughs> as you can think. It is a mass on a spring. It is Back at O-level GCSE physics, you have a spring, you have a mass, you put a vibration on it, and guess what? The mass is going to vibrate up and down. This is just vibrating up and down from ambient. As you see it passed around, you will see it, it, that it is always in motion, re relatively low resonance. So what you need to do is pick up the motion of this mass. And we start off at the, quant at the conventional domain, but we have to drill in to see how the quantum effects come in. So, here is the sensor. Um, if we zoom in on that little red box, this is where our displacement transducer, what's going to measure the tiny vibrations of that mass, where that um, we're zooming in. So our position transducer is made out of two sets of electrodes, one moving, one fixed. And as they go in and out of registry, we see a signal coming out. And it's a conventional capacitance uh, measurement where the gap between the two, in fact, the overlap between the two plates um, is going to be read off as a change in the voltage as the capacitance changes. So we zoom in further. So we're now down to the level of the electrodes, 12 microns. I mean, it's a quarter of the diameter of a human hair, but we're still in the conventional regime. Now we zoom in on that little red square, and this is 100 nanometers. Now... This is where we're getting down. This is the surface of our gold electrodes. I shouldn't say this is the surface of our gold electrodes. This is somebody else who's done the hard work of imaging a gold surface. Um, but if we go in even further, here are the gold atoms all arrayed on the surface um, for the particular crystal orientation. The spacing, 288 picometers. Now... How accurate is our sensor? Let's just take one of those gold atoms. That's 144 picometers in radius. This is the smallest distance we can measure, 1.4 picometers. So we're measuring the displacement of that proof mass with our capacitance sensor, not at the atomic level, but at the subatomic level. In fact, 80 times the size of the gold nucleus, which is that little black dot in the middle. So we're really shrinking down how we're measuring. And because of that, what is, looks like a conventional device, the quantum effects come up and bite us. And they bite us for the very simple reason 
those electrons on the surface of those atoms, they are rearrange themselves. And they are rearrange themselves, unfortunately, depending on however the crystal of the gold goes down. And when you solve Schrodinger's equation for the surface states, each of the rearrangements comes up with a different energy. Here is just one particular solution um, of the surface state. And you can actually map out the energy of all those surface states. So what you thought was a, a really nice capacitor with one voltage on one plate and another voltage on another plate looks like this, which is very pretty, but is not great if you want to do a precision measurement. And this, which is called the patch effect, which I think is a prosaic name for something that actually looks quite beautiful, the patch effect means everything from equivalence principles to gravity wave detectors all have to battle the, the patch effect. Now, one of the things that we have in our group is the ability to microfabricate. And as you see, we split up these sensors, uh, we split up the electrodes into thin 12 micron strips. What we're essentially doing is we're carving up the quantum states. So when we look at each of the strips of our electrode, Instead of that beautiful pattern, what we actually see is along most of the line, we have just one quantum state. And now, as the electrons are going over each other, they're not seeing a lot of change happening. It is still there, the noise is still there, but it's much reduced. So this is really pushing down our quantum uh, contribution to our noise. Essentially, for the mathematically inclined, we're pushing down the limits of integration in our noise term by shrinking it in the appropriate dimension. It's a, it's a quantum squeezing effect. Now, actually, we have to battle on two fronts at the same time. We have the thermodynamic noise sources, the conventional sources coming from on top. We have our patch effect, our surface state fluctuations coming from underneath, um, all the way up to what Neil first uh, absolutely correctly said, the quantum in every semiconductor even bites us in our preamplifiers, in the combination, recombination noise that comes in from the states in the semiconductor. So once we've done all of this, once we've woven our way through all of these noise sources, minimized their contributions, balanced them out as far as we can, this is how we can get that 1.4 picometer resolution. And what does that actually get us? It means that when we put our sensor up against the conventional sensor, we get very similar performance. Now, here are two traces from a large conventional seismometer and the micro seismometer, um, the micro seismometer above, the conventional seismometer below. Here it is in the time domain over a weekend. And you can see an earthquake coming in here from the Marianas Trench, the other side of the Earth. And you can also see in the background these two signals going up and down in synchronicity with an 11-hour period. That is the Earth tide coming in as the Earth itself is slowly squeezing and being relaxed from the Moon. So we've both got high, high, frequency, um, uh, high frequencies that we can look at and very low frequencies right at the bottom of the range. Uh, another way of looking at this, when we do most of our testing in the, in the basement at Oxford who make the electronics for us, the sensors are made here. Um, here is a, an earthquake coming in um, from Chile, here from Indonesia. But on the Sunday, we can see at higher frequencies, if we zoom in, a very distinct signature coming in on our seismic trace. In fact, that is the bell towers of Oxford. <laughs> and every time the bells uh, <laughs> are, are struck and you go through the changes, you excite the resonance and we can pick those up in fact, we can tell where the towers are. Um, it was quite an interesting conversation to the, uh, the, the, the very organized people who, who do the bell ringing in Oxford saying, we think you were ringing at 11 o'clock on Sunday because we saw it on our seismic traces. Um, OK, so we're actually trying to measure very small accelerations. So we know on Earth, for instance, that the um, We've got an acceleration 9.8 meters per second, 1G. Our instrument, our requirement that we had one nano G resolution, in fact, we've beaten it by a factor of four. We're at 
nanogs resolution. So to scale, to, 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 for comparison, that's the gravity field of the Earth, 1g. 0.25 nano g is the gravity field of an apple. So that is the level that we can get down to, but it also begs the question, in fact it was a question, um, a, a, a consideration that Einstein had at the beginning of the century. Acceleration, gravity, aren't they kind of equivalent? He put it a bit more eloquently. We arrive at a very satisfactory interpretation of the law of experience. If we assume that the system K and K dashed are physically exactly equivalent, that is, if we assume that we may just as well regard the system K as being in a space free of gravitational fields, if we then regard K as uniformly accelerated, which means you don't know whether you're actually on the surface of the Earth or you're in an, uh, 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 an elevator accelerating up at G, all of the physics is the same. So we made an accelerometer, a seismometer, but we've also made a gravity sensor. And there's a very nice experiment, in fact, let's go right back to the first experiment, the Cavendish experiment. The way that you measure gravity is to look directly for the force between two masses. And Cavendish did this in uh, 1798. It was a beautifully elegant experiment. And he determined the mass of the Earth, and from that big G, by looking at the, the uh, movement of uh, lead balls connected to a torsion wire and gold balls. Now, we've updated this. So we take the micro-seismometer we've developed for Mars and we put it in front of a swinging pendulum. So here you can see the pendulum moving backwards and forwards, supported from the roof of the vault where we're doing this experiment. These are very small signals. We want to take off what the background is, so we have a conventional seismometer in the background there, rather um, overpowering our little micro-seismometer. And we can look at the two traces from that. So there's the reference, there's the micro-seismometer. When we subtract them, we see that we are getting a signal. We're also getting the signal of Triss as he goes in to put the pendulum in motion. But if we zoom in here, that is the mass signal. So we are directly detecting that pendulum moving this is, in fact, dynamic gravity sensing. So we're tracking a mass as it is moving across the room. Of course, we chose it so that we knew what was happening. That was important. Um, but where does this get us? What does 0.25 nano g of performance get us in terms of applications? So there's a very long way round to answer the question set in the last minute of an exam, which is never a good idea. But, um, we can look at five centimetre change in water level. That's five nanog. So if you've got an ocean that moves by five centimetres, if you're looking at it from 100 kilometres above or 250 kilometres above, you'll be able to detect that right at the limits. A tunnel 10 metres below the surface or mass distribution in cargo on a truck. So specifically, so this is um, looking at Greenland over the last... Uh, 15 years, in fact, from 2003 to 2013. And this is actually measuring directly from space the mass loss of the ice. And, in fact, this isn't five centimetres of change. It would be great if it was. It's actually three metres of change. And even worse, if you can see down there, the slope seems to be increasing. So we definitely have the resolution to start to see from that direction. But we can also go much closer. So here are, so this is taking our sensor, this is modeled outputs, this is something that we are now working on um, with Kinetic, in fact, um, to map underground. And this is a model of our sensor, two tunnels, two meters in diameter, so uh, big enough for uh, uh, human use, um, 10 metres below the surface, and we've put a random distribution of rocks. And the top of these, as the gravity, the gravity gradient, in fact, the difference between two sensors um, in the vertical and the horizontal direction, this is the signal, and this is the source. You can see we're losing very little information because our sensor has got such low noise. And finally, if we look at what is happening potentially with cargo, and this was looked at some time ago, 
Argonne, Argonne National Laboratory looked at this uh, 10 years ago, where they modeled what was happening if you were to have such sensors and you were to just drive a truck past them. And then you have an inversion problem. From the data that you have on the right-hand side, what can you infer, or how good can you get the guess back to the left-hand side? And the answer is, actually, not bad at all. In fact, the major error is in the constraints on the density, but they've got the locations right, and those masses were, were uh, uh, used, they were specified to be what you might see from, say, depleted uranium. If someone was trying to put something through on the slide, and it's really difficult to hide mass. So that's where we are. We've demonstrated the highest performance of a micromachine sensor. We've got a unique mass performance metric. That's what brought us here in the first place. Um, we've got low noise, and we've definitely had to look at the quantum effects to get there. We've got a broadband response. We can see everywhere from bell towers in Oxford to earth tides. And we're now starting to move into gravity sensing. So thanks very much. <laughs>